Welcome, YouTubers, to Mystery History. Okay, so before we do that, just briefly, we had a great year, great season. Um, how would you summarize? How would you say? I think two things for me. One was, you know, for the first time ever, really in the in the ten years, we brought significant technologies, new technologies to the fore, and you know, you had the big three: the swamp, ten X, and the money pit. You had to go at the money pit. Yes. With high tech gear. And I got out of the swamp. And you got out of the swamp, but we are going back yeah, there, whether yeah, you yeah, like yeah. it or not. So, you know, that's that's the, the new side. And then we brought back technology that we have been using, i.e. Gary Clayton with the or Gary Drayton with the metal detecting. And we found we made some I think some significant finds. Now we we've yet to interpret the value, the significance of those finds, right. in my opinion. But I've always said, and I continue to believe, that this is every bit of an information hunt as it is a treasure hunt. And, and I, I well, a lot of that stuff's still being analyzed, right? The coins, because we found a whole bunch of coins, a lot of coins in one spot. That was new. And those are all being analyzed, right? Those have been sent away to see what, what they date out at. So that'll be interesting. And then, to me, it was that digging you mentioned, you know, with the big equipment. I'm really proud because it was a technological, technologically difficult thing. And we pulled it off. We dug in the money pit. We certainly verified. We're closing in on the original location of the money pit with all the data we're pulling out from underground. So, I would say those are the most significant things. And yeah, the other thing too is what really uh, I believed in and, and wanted to see done was for Dan Hensky to to have charge of a project, i.e., the the work in Smith's Cove. Dan sincerely believed that we could find the the long sought after and fabled um, drain system. And uh, we think that we came to uh, an assessment, if you will. Perhaps we didn't find the true box-covered drains, but certainly we found evidence that there was man-made. Sort of, you know, what is it? Box drain, French drain. I mean, something to channel water. Sure, looks like you found it. Well, the description of you know the two pieces of flagstone uh, with a with a top cover yeah. over it. You might have found what was left. It's possible. Possible. So, so those are typical you, Rick. You know, he's really happiest because Dan Hensky had the indication. He never thanks anybody else, which is really nice. Let's do the questions. These okay. are these are fan questions first. All right, I've got one here from Joan, and Joan says, "Will you continue to look for other possible treasure troves on Oak Island, or perhaps broad, broaden your horizons and search elsewhere in the world?" Well, that's a great question. I think before we. I won't say give up because he'll shoot me if I use the word give up. But surely push up. Yeah, chair. exactly. That's a kind of a high chair. Uh, yeah, we're going to look all over Oak Island because one of my pet theories is that the money pit is a ruse, that it that whatever was buried there is buried in a much easier to get location. So we're going to look around. And then the second part of this question is great in that, yeah, it does. This this sort of treasure hunting is is infectious. And we've already invested. I'll just tell you, we've already invested in some other. Um, treasures around the world with, with some success. So that's that's my your, your turn. This one's from Patricia. It says, Rick, Marty, when you find the fingers of the filtration system, might it be possible to block or divert the main arm so that once the bladder system is empty, the water won't flood back into the tunnels and shafts? Love the show. Thanks for the adventure. I well, appreciate the kind words, but um, the filtration system is a bit more complex for one simple reason. And this relates to everything on Oak Island. 220 years of search, it's been highly uh, disruptive, those processes, those search agendas. So we're not really sure that the integrity of that filter system remains to the extent that it can be found and blocked off, or certainly tried. Yeah, I would just simply say, I don't believe you can shut off the water anymore. I think if it was as described at one time, you could, but because of what Rick just said, you can't anymore. So James. James says, I uh, love the search for, for the history of the truth. Guys, don't give up. Don't give up, Rick. Which he's not going to. My question to you all is, in your heart, what do you all believe the truth is about who came to Oak Island? 
the history, I believe, is more important than the treasure. I, you yeah, know, you, to that. you would certainly agree with that. I'm not totally sold on that. But the short answer is I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Something odd happened there. Somebody came there. Somebody deposited coconut fibers in mass quantities. Somebody did some odd things there. I don't know who it was. After, after 10 years of search, we don't know who that entity was. I totally agree, but search continues. It's every bit as much information hunt as treasure hunt. This one's from Mike. Rick and Marty, what has been your greatest achievement so far? Also, do you plan further investigation at the hatch? Um, regarding the hatch, um, you know, some new information has come to light. Uh, a researcher has come forward using uh, what's called sacred geometry and gematria. Uh, we have X marks the spot. Uh, it's close to the so-called hatch, but the hatch, as we, as was shown in the show, uh, I think we've explored that to the point where it's, you know, uh, you know we've kind of written that off. But that this, spot that spot but this new information is very intriguing and um, stay tuned Joey says here's my question why can't you go down in 10x place a big canvas balloon in the flood tunnels blow them up drain what's at the bottom and inspect what's there without the murky water we thought about this mm -hmm. we thought about actually using a plastic type thing that would inflate against the sides and then you could see through it it would push the murky water away I mean, this is a good idea, but the, it's the same answer. Things have been so messed up, and there are so many places that water comes in now because of the searching and, and frankly, dynamiting and things like that, that I just don't think this will work. It's a good idea. We kicked it around ourselves, mm -hmm. but I just think technologically it won't work at this point. Well, plus that, that flies in the face of your belief that the case on, you know, the integrity of the case on the wall won't be. Well, but it, actually, that wouldn't be a problem. He's talking about a pressurized system. Well, we'd have, we we would have in, we'd have internal pressure, you know, if we, if we, or at least there could be a way to keep the internal pressure. Because I'm worried about collapse. Mm -hmm. So, okay, this one's from Paul. There seems to be the potential of there being more than just one treasure. Any thoughts as to how many different treasures could be on and around the island? The short answer to that is no. Um, I I have always believed since I was a little boy that. It, the island had been suborned by more than one party to do something. Um, you know, that, that elusive proof is just that, still elusive. Uh, but I do believe that there's, perhaps the island has been used by more than one group entity. Wait, they said no. no. There seems to be a no that I don't have any thoughts as to how many. No, I oh, don't you don't know many, but you think there are more than one. I do. Okay, I do. All right, well, Elissa, or yeah, I think it's Elissa, says, has anyone ever put energy into surveying or excavating the nearby islands for evidence of war camps? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, the last show, we talked to, what was his name, Gary Clayton. Clayton, and he spent an enormous amount of money on Little Mash. Little Mash, and we, we get information from people all the time about how they've, you know, found strange signs on this island and that island and theories that the tunnels actually connect them also. Yes, there's been a lot of work done on that. We haven't done a lot of it, but others have. So this one's from Corey. What did you find or discover that convinced you that it was worthwhile to spend big money on excavations? You and your team seem like you cross your T's and dot your I's. So there must have been, so there must have been one or more particular things that told you you're not wasting Wait, money. Wait, who is this? Corey. Corey needs to come to the war room from now. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, for me, it's just a simple matter of faith. And that's really what it is. I mean, yes, we found intriguing things. Yes, it's been 220 years of search. Some incredible, talent, incredibly talented people have come and gone with as much passion, as much fortitude, as much interest, as much money, and have failed. But they believe. And I think the core of Oak Island is believing. Uh, I think you need to have faith no matter what you endeavor to do in life. And I, I believe that there's a reason to continue. Can I articulate it? One, two, three, four, five. Mm, in some ways, yes. But the core of my, my wanting to continue is, is believing. That's where Rick and I often disagree. Because, you know what, I, I wouldn't have 
question here is, well, how would you answer them? I'm about to. <laughs> no, belief isn't enough. Belief isn't enough. Unsupported belief, I don't think, is enough. And that's, I'm not saying he's wrong. I just disagree. I think we found enough, uh, and maybe it's just pure sort of cussed stubbornness, but I wasn't about to leave that island without digging in the money pit. You know, there's been an awful lot of things described in there that are worth going after. But I, no, I would not proceed just on faith. But that doesn't make you wrong. It doesn't make me right. Um, Mary Scott uh, asks, in Smith's Cove, instead of trying to find the ends of the box drain in the water, can't you dig a trench further up on the bank following the water coastline to find the one main box that connects the other and stop the water flow that way? Absolutely excellent, excellently analyzed, has been done. Uh, Dunfield had a go at that, I believe. On the South Shore. Not, 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 not on the... Uh, um, Blair did it. Uh, they drilled a series of holes across the shoreline. Uh, they actually put in a hundred... But not Smith's Cove. In Smith's Cove. Okay, that's what Dunfield did South Shore. Okay. Um, uh, Blair did... Um, they actually, in one of the holes, um, they put dynamite in each yeah, of the holes. There you go again. And somewhere between, <coughs> I believe, 80 and 140 pounds of dynamite. And the, the one hole that contained 140 pounds of dynamite, they actually thought they had uh, intersected the, the confluence of the drains. And the reason why they believe that is because a huge gush of water came up out of that hole. And then after that explosion, what they did is they, they put a bunch of clay into Smith's Cove and the water in the money pit. Well, two things happened. After the explosion, the water in the money pit roiled and boiled and Obviously, there was a connection between the, the, the hole that had been dug on, on the shoreline and the money pit. The other thing that happened is they pushed a bunch of clay out into Smith's Cove, and the, immediately, well, almost immediately, the water in the money pit became muddy. So, um, there obviously, they may have done some interdiction, if you will, but um, not enough to allow us to go down. Yeah, to me that was a bad idea. I guess I can, I mean, dynamite, dynamite blows things up. Dynamite doesn't seal things, especially when, the, I think their concept of the, of the drain was wrong. The drain, as I understand it, is a series of rocks that are keeping the water flow. Well, you're not going to stop that with dynamite. You might That's make right. it worse. They want to uh, the, I suppose their thought was they could collapse it or whatever. I never would use dynamite because that just screws everything up. I mean, I wouldn't have done it. Again, it doesn't make me any, doesn't make them wrong, right. doesn't make me back right, then, but I wouldn't have done it. Back then? Well, it might have been fun. <laughs> Blowing things up, I mean, that's a great thing. No, but back then, you wonder. I mean, here's the criticism of, of Robert Dunfield's enterprise was, you know, why did he take the big Orton crane and dig the giant No, hole? I get that. He thought he was going to find it. Well, plus he used the technology that was available. Well, dynamite's still available. Anyway, I think the short answer is you can't stop the water anymore. It's been... It's coming in from multiple places now, from all the pumping. So so anyway, Mary Scott's analysis, I would rather than what you just described, I think what she's describing would have been better had it been done when things were still intact. Come across, find it, lock it. That's a great idea. And Problem don't up. dynamite a bunch of holes. The water table there is so low, how would you know if you had cut it? Cut you should it see this rocks. You should see the rocks. I mean, I think. You know how difficult it was. I know, I know, but it's not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. idea. Concept if things were so messed up, I think we we thought about doing this this year, this very thing. So it's a good idea. Um, Who's turn? Is it mine? Mine. Yeah. Oh, you're, go ahead. Uh, this one's from Sherry. Absolutely love the show. Can't wait until Tuesday evening to get my Rick and Marty fix. My question is, how do you as brothers keep up the optimism and beliefs? Both of you are an inspiration and an example of the true meaning of brothership. Um, for me, it's easy to be optimistic and believe because I fall back on I've always believed. Um, you know, and it's not just faith. It, I, I agree with Marty that look, we've made some interesting finds. We've we've done some incredible research. You know, uh, and and because of the show, because of people like yourselves, we constantly get new information. We get we get uh, with these questions. We get quite intuitive. Um, questions and, and inf information from from people. We've not come to Oak Island with a belief that 
surely we're the ones and we're the only ones. That's 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 just not who we are. No. So Laura says what what this? Oh, I don't know. I get it from you, I think. <laughs> the inspiration. I, I you know, I, I, I go up and down, you know that. I've been ready to quit a couple times, honestly, but you know, I come back to what you say. You don't want to leave with regrets. And, and we're closing in. We're throwing a lot of assets at this. Um, you know, I'm hoping for some significant success pretty soon. And there's some interesting things coming up on the next two episodes, too. Laura says, why do you think that the treasure is even still buried there? Isn't it a possibility that the treasure has already been found and taken hundreds of years ago? This is one of my big worries, Laura. Um, absolutely. If somebody went to the all this bother to put in this hugely complicated treasure protection system, they would have known how to get around it, could have come back without much fanfare at all and got the thing. I mean, there could be there could be some people laughing in their graves right now at the Lagina brothers, but but Rick doesn't believe that. And I think it's a possibility and even if this was on <laughs> I think it's a possibility, and even if, it, but even if it, if it if it if that did happen, there could be stuff there yet. And remember, you always say that doesn't that doesn't foreclose the idea of figuring out the whole mystery, which is part of this search. This one's from James. Why don't you use ground penetrating sonar instead of regular metal detectors? Uh, I don't know if you're talking about seismic. The problem with all of that underground technology, it really is the interpretive side of that technology is looking for shallow depth features, small anomalous features at shallow depths is really in its infancy. Uh, we were asked actually by a company that had come in uh, with this radically new technologies and they actually asked us to fund their research regarding uh, small interpreting small anomalous features at shallow depths because they didn't they didn't have that capability. And so it's a great idea. We would love to pursue it, but we've always thought about using seismic. But seismic, you're looking for large anomalies at great depths, and it's not applicable in this situation. So, but we're constantly uh, keeping an open mind and, and hoping that some new technologies will surface. So, Rich asks, is it possible to put an airlock on T1 or C1 and pressure pressurize it to push out the water. Air might also escape from the flood tunnels revealing their location. Of course, entry into the dry holes would be dangerous and a lengthy decompression would be needed to prevent the bends. It would be a modern day equivalent of building the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, Rich is exactly correct. Um, you know, this is something we are entertaining. Uh, we had entertained in the, this for 10X. It wouldn't work in 10X because of all the different leaks everywhere, but it might very well work in C1. You know, we do, I mean, it's, we, have a, we have a pipe in place sufficiently stout to take this pressure. Uh, it would be working, Rich, Rich obviously understands the physics of this because you would be working as if you were diving uh, all the time and, and so it would have to be almost like a, a saturation dive. But this might work. We are, we are thinking about doing this. It's easy actually. to cap it. Yeah, this would, it would work in, in those two. He's absolutely correct. It's a, it's a great thought. Uh, this one's from Steve. What if the flood tunnels were actually originally ventilation shafts that become flood tunnels as the sea levels have risen? Could it be that the actual caverns slash caves are much older than they are believed to be and that the vertical money pit was originally dug to reach the cavern after the sea levels rose? Again, it, is it a possibility? Absolutely it's a possibility and we're still trying to figure out you know, the whys and wherefores of, of it. But we, I think that the work that we did in Smith's Cove this year, the, the fact that I think we believe that there's a French drain out there, uh, that is counterintuitive to, to what he's arguing here. But could this be so? Yes, it could be. Okay, I think this is my last one. It is uh, from John, and he says, there is a known underwater dive that supposedly resulted in finding a chamber that seems similar to a tomb with Templar artifacts and maybe even a body. Why have you never had your diver take a look? It seems relatively inexpensive and not too time consuming. I, 
I don't quite understand this question because we did have our diver take a look. I mean, he couldn't see. Uh, it was all by feel in 10X. And some of these things were sort of come and go, John. In other words, the body, we think we've eliminated that that was a body. It was kind of a, well, <laughs> Rick does it, of course, but but uh, we have sent a diver down to do this, and we're not done. We're not done with it. No, not in 10X. Do you have any more? No, that's it. Okay. Well, um, there's the Q&A. Thank you all. We really appreciate it. We appreciate the support from everybody out there. I mean, I've never been involved. I said this, say it again, and I, Rick, I'm sure will agree. Never been involved in something where everybody wants you so badly to succeed, and it means a lot to us. It helps us in our sort of dark moments. Uh, and then we've been asked to, uh, well, do you want to say anything? From what that? dark moments? I have dark <laughs> moments. <laughs> I have dark moments, okay? You know, can't get discouraged. I, I, you know that. You do even sometimes. Yeah, well, yes and no. Okay. But um, I, I do also want to want to reiterate what Marty just said. In, in any endeavor of life, wherever you set your goals, no matter what you attempt to do, it seems as though there's always a naysayer. There's always someone who will say to you, you can't, you shouldn't, you won't. And in this particular endeavor, Oak Island, we have never heard that no. from anyone. Not only have the people in the province of Nova Scotia been highly supportive of, of government, our, the government's been supportive, the, the but, environmental people, but everyone else is, is indicative or indicated by these questions. I mean, everyone is so fascinated by the mystery and so involved and intrigued and and interested. The support we've received, I can't say thank you enough. Me, me, same. I agree. Yep. Okay, and then we've been asked for, okay, there's two more episodes, there's some really interesting things, you know, we hope you all stay tuned, obviously. Um, and so we were asked for a teaser, and, and we kicked this around a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And I think maybe everybody's a little bit sick of wood. Uh, we've, I mean, the wood is highly significant, and we're trying to date it all, and, you know, some has been hand-hewn, and some has been circular sawed, and we're looking for original workings. I'll just say this, I will say this, in the next two episodes, it's not just wood, look for metal. How's that? Perfect. Okay, thank you all, appreciate it. Um, keep your faith in us, it's, it's, uh, it's appreciated. Keep believing and thank you.
Welcome, YouTubers, to Mystery History. The story of Oak Island has captured the imaginations of man and boy alike for centuries, a story of pirates, mystery, and buried treasure, it has all the ingredients of a brilliant adventuristic treasure quest, missing all but one thing, the treasure. Many of you may have viewed my last two videos regarding the hunt on Oak Island. I assure you that all of the information was conveyed in good faith, however a few of you brought to my attention suspicions surrounding artifacts that have recently come to light. I am talking of course, of the Roman sword, supposedly found by a scallop fisherman just off of the coast of Oak Island itself. During the next few minutes, I am going to reveal some shocking new developments regarding the possible location of the treasure, new information, objects, and clues, that might change our whole perceptions of the man-made structures within the islands. I am also going to be taking you on a journey, to reveal the true reasons for the controversy surrounding the sword, they go much higher than you may have thought. So sit back, get out the popcorn, and enjoy. Due to new injections of funds, the examination of the money pit has been able to be cast further afield, with some startling discoveries. Firstly a rock has been discovered on neighboring Reeks Island, that appears to have an image of a face carved into it. The reasons for the face and also its alien appearance are as yet unknown, although there are suspicions that it is connected to the treasure. Further investigation of surrounding islands found one's layout to resemble a seahorse. Other strange anomalies have been located, the most noted of which being the triangle feature on neighboring Birch Island. Also the stone cipher has been examined again, with some now believing that the stone itself was what the pit was for, the stone being a map of an underground layout of the islands. Yes that's right. Keith Ranville believes the islands are connected by underground tunnels from the money pit to neighboring Birch Island, and even further. He thinks all the digging that has gone on so far has been a waste of time. He states, the instructions at the bottom of the pit tell you about where and how to locate these shafts and I believe they're in Mahone Bay, this is a significant Nova Scotia heritage discovery and that it is Canada's national treasure brought here for our guardianship long before Canada was established we should respect the civilization that is responsible for the makings of these structures. They were a very unique culture and may hold the secret to many ancient structures. He believes that Oak Island should now be preserved so that they can better establish an action plan to find the tunnels in Mahone Bay. The funding for the projects are now flowing nicely, which is very good for a man by the name of Pulitzer. Pulitzer is the main man when it comes to the show on the History Channel, that is now fueling the hunt. He is a keen believer, and a big funder into alternative history. So when a Roman sword came to light on the island, I'm sure it couldn't have made him happier, this sword is causing controversy for numerous reasons. And the fact that the History Channel are refusing to let anyone examine it, is a rousing suspicion regarding its authenticity. If it is indeed authentic however, it means the versions of history we are all taught at school is incorrect. Something Pulitzer strongly believes, and with a new museum in the pipelines, with the Ancient Artifact Preservation Society, dealing in controversial artifacts, this sword couldn't have appeared at a better time. However convenience does not mean guilt, as of yet the sword's origins are unknown. Pulitzer and his team are not the first to put forward a theory that ancient Europeans visited the Americas in pre-Columbian times, with others also pointing to the Minoans and the Phoenicians as having visited the continent. 16th century scholar Marinius Siculo, first claimed it was the Romans who discovered the New World, not Columbus. Pulitzer believes the reason for the objections surrounding the sword featured on the show are as follows, and I quote, we have absolutely been led to believe that nothing happened on this side of the pond before Christopher Columbus, that's a church-induced concept, all the ancient records that exist make it very clear the world was circumnavigated and the world was round. 
But when the Catholic Church and the Romans came in, all those records were destroyed so we had to kind of relearn this stuff. History is political on our side of the pond. There's been so much politicizing of who is native, and what was the first nation, that when discoveries come about that change this, it's wildly controversial. The problem is, to rewrite history it would mean rewriting every textbook and university course in the world. That's the detriment. I think anything that challenges history is very risky, very dangerous, and extremely political. But I think the world has matured and history may force politics to mature, he continues, I think we should all fight for the truth and people should make up their own minds. We are just saying here's what we have found. Google will tell you that most of the searches for Oak Island also include a reference to the Knights Templar, television uses this information to appeal to the fans of those types of theories. But I'm a historian and forensic researcher. My job is to not believe any particular theory, but let the evidence tell me where to go. I believe that many different ancient mariner societies came to Oak Island and it was an important stopover for them. We just hope our report will open the dialogue that will rewrite history as we know it. If we can just get rid of this Columbus conspiracy. Concluding, he added, I think as humans we have evolved enough to be able to handle the truth now. It's time for theory to be reflected by hard science. It's a trillion dollar treasure we are uncovering in history for our children and grandchildren. Pulitzer says the sword is 100% confirmed and described it as the smoking gun to his theory. The supposed ceremonial sword came out of a shipwreck. The object first came to his attention when a man contacted the show to reveal its existence. Pulitzer states, some years ago, a man and his son were scalloping off Oak Island, when they brought up their nets, the sword came up with it. The father kept it for decades, and when he died it went to his wife, then his daughter. Then when she died many years later it went to her husband. It was he who came forward to the island and said I think you should know about this and where it was found. Pulitzer claims the complex metallic properties of the sword match those of other ancient Roman artifacts. All this information however means nothing, and rightly so, without any official examination on the sword, we cannot do anything with this information. If the sword is real and it is going to support Pulitzer's cause so greatly, then it begs the question why all the secrecy? Along with the History Channel's claim of the island's bloodlust, with the death count apparently having to reach seven before it will give up its gold, even though far more than seven have already died in its attempted retrieval, you start to wonder. Is it all just a publicity stunt? Has the treasure secretly been found and stolen? Was there any treasure to begin with? Wherever there is money you will always find lies and corruption, but this should not take anything away from what has actually occurred so far on the island, the things in which we know have been found. These things lean towards the overwhelming fact that there is, or was something very significant buried there. And I think Keith Ranville is onto something, whether the sword be real or fake, the fact that the controversy surrounding the island continues to fund the hunt, is a good thing for all. The fact that there are new clues being found and new hypothesis being built as such, means the developments will continue to surface. And I promise to keep you all informed on all the developments impartially. Stay tuned for my in-depth look into Keith Ranville's new hypothesis packed with evidence that the entire network of Nova Scotian islands may be hand-built, and an underground layer filled with vaults lay buried just waiting to be discovered. By those with heart and a nose for treasure, as always, thanks for watching. Please leave your comments. Hello fellow treasure hunters, welcome back. A vast amount of time has passed since we last visited our most alluring and indeed most expensive treasure hunt ever undertaken. And although time may pass, and the world continues to sail by upon the horizon, perched within the ferocious and seemingly never-ending waters surrounding Nova Scotia, remains our shaft-ridden rock 
ever unchanging, our island of oak. She has clung to her secrets with almighty persistence, only ever willing to relinquish her gifts to the very utmost of worthy. We have, upon many occasions, presented evidence, artifacts, and structural anomalies found upon and around the island that for over 200 years has demonstrated to all those involved strong indications of something hiding in this island. During this long break, we have, as always, endeavored to sink investigative fangs into the numerous leads we are inevitably presented with while exploring this web of dead ends and red herrings destined only to create even greater levels of confusion regarding the vast enigma. However, we believe, regardless of this, that we have gotten tantalizingly close to this ultimate secret, which is a piece of information we now strongly believe is still known by some of the most wealthy figures still alive to this day. How Oak Island was originally constructed, when and by who, yet alas, although we have some extremely good possibilities, we still don't know for a certainty what was hidden there. The character known as Martin Frobisher, who is known for creating what is now called the Fool's Gold Mine, some 300 miles from Oak Island, he had apparently mined over 200 tons of iron ore, thinking it was gold. When he returned to England with his bounty, the Crown confiscated the lot. It was they who then claimed that Frobisher, along with 300 expert Cornish miners, had made a catastrophic error in mistaking iron for gold. During our extensive research into the possibility of Martin Frobisher actually being involved in the hiding of a contingency treasure upon the island in the event of sabotage, we have indeed fallen down a rabbit hole of conspiracy, deceit, and concealed protected truths. The voyage which involved this retrieval of ore was funded by Edward de Vere, the Duke of Oxford. The miners involved were tin miners. This fact in particular is pivotal in arguing Frobisher's original role upon the island. The tin miners of old were notoriously talented at digging tunnel mines looking for seams of tin. The technique created by ancient Polynesian miners, it is indeed a team of men capable of creating such elaborate tunnel systems beneath Oak Island, and although they, along with Frobisher, had incentive to bury possibly many tons of gold there, the main man behind the funding of this mission has somehow come into main focus surrounding this enigmatic sequence of events within Nova Scotia, and also within England just prior to the pit's discovery in 1795. Although this story is too large for one sitting, we will start with a small portion. Edward de Vere was in all possibility the writer of the works of William Shakespeare, and the last of the pedogenic kings of Europe. It was he who had a true treasure to hide, a treasure bestowed upon his family as far back as Ralph de Sudley. Edward de Vere could be seen as the Grail Knight. The reasons why will soon become clear. The lodestone, often overlooked, which rests on the south shore, points to true north, adjusted for magnetic deviation. This equilateral triangle was discovered in 1897, but its significance has been missed for many years. Because of shifts in the Earth's magnetic field, there is still considerable magnetic variation as far north as Oak Island. Since the year 1550, true north indicated by the lodestone has only occurred twice, once in 1620 and once in about 1780. Whoever set this lodestone up had advanced knowledge of astronomy and navigation, very likely acquainted with Sir William Gilbert Queen Elizabeth's personal physician, known for authoring the scientific treatise on the lodestone. Vere would pass away in 1604, shortly before the initial alignment. Interestingly, Robert Richardson, an experienced petroleum engineer who was a close friend of Bob Dunfield, when questioned regarding the riddle of shafts within the island, mentioned that he always suspected that the design was reminiscent of Egyptian tombs. D.J. Hansen, director of the De Vere Foundation, upon hearing this information, began a search to find Bob Dunfield to discuss the possibility of Edward De Vere actually having been buried on the island accompanied by his artifacts to sacred, namely the Holy Grail and most likely so much more, for instance his secret Shakespearean texts. 
Bob would reveal photographs taken some years earlier at a depth of 250 feet under the island within a limestone cavern, which has now become known as the Oxford Tomb. Not only was there something resting in this cavern, but Bob as well as Hansen both strongly feel it is a tomb. More precisely, the sarcophagus of a secret king, namely the burial chamber of De Vere. In our next segment, we will be revealing many more pieces of compelling historical evidence to support this amazing assertion now made by numerous well-known treasure hunters and mainstream historians, including the connection of Sir Francis to this burial chamber in the most intriguing of forms. There are now many dots beginning to connect in regards to activities upon our island prior to the boy's discovery, yet we still feel there is something still being concealed in regards to this treasure buried on Oak Island, a secret we will never give up on finding. As always, thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more. Hello fellow treasure hunters, welcome back. Firstly, although our research has of recent gone off on somewhat of a tangent, we intend to finish telling of the Shakespearean connection this evening, in preparation of something I'm sure we've all been waiting for. Yes, it is true, our brothers are indeed returning to the island. In fact, they never left. And although the island has understandably been off limits, our intrepid treasure hunting brothers have been busy within our pit during the summer before we inevitably plunge into another roller coaster ride of suspense, discovery, and of course, hidden treasure, let's continue where we left off and finish what we started several videos ago. We promised during the last visit to our Nova Scotian money pit that a compelling link can indeed be made between the island and the first Viscount St. Alban, Sir Francis Bacon. We also attested to the belief that Edward de Vere was in fact the writer of Shakespeare. Dr. Orville Ward Owen, believed that Sir Francis Bacon had written Shakespeare's plays and that he later concealed these and other manuscripts in a vault that lay buried in the Wye River bed. Owen amazingly deduced this from his extensive research of Francis Bacon's writings and many other legitimate sources. He later organized an expedition to the Wye River, which was successful. He did indeed find, at the mouth of the Wye, a room-sized chamber made of stone and cement, buried, or rather submerged, within the riverbed. Could this strange concrete layer set within a muddy submerged riverbed be seen as Bacon's preparations for a pit he was to dig on Oak Island, dug within similar conditions? Could Dr. Owen have been spot on regarding what Bacon was intending to hide, yet mistaken regarding who wrote them? The room he found was empty but he did state that marks left within were unmistakably left by Bacon. After he died in 1924, his student Burrell Ruth fortunately continued his research. By 1939, Ruth was a doctor of philosophy, teaching chemical engineering at Iowa University. When Ruth was introduced to the details surrounding the Oak Island money pit, it was the small parchment and the complexity of the engineering involved that led Dr. Ruth to conclude this was indeed the remote whereabouts of which Baconians had spent over a generation pondering. This particular collection of evidence to us insinuates that the chamber on the Y was but a mere practice attempt, indeed made by the genius Bacon, made in preparation for what now lay in Oak Island. Edward de Vere's tomb, Shakespearean plays, some never released, and several tons of Viking gold. All of the circumstantial and supportive evidence for this theory has now been covered in this and several of our previous videos. 
Although initially, we perceived the Francis Bacon and Shakespeare connection as a silly conspiracy, the deep-running historical connections, Bacon, Shakespeare, even the Queen of England, makes for an extremely compelling web of coincidental connection and subsequent events, one that if we are again led towards in the future, we will undoubtedly revisit. However, for now, we will be keeping a very keen and excited eye upon the developing events being made public upon the island this coming November. As always, thanks for watching. Hello fellow treasure hunters, welcome back. Before we delve into the details of our most recent investigative developments, continuing on with our thread of adventure, discovery and possible treasure, resting deep within this tree-covered rock, we need to give out an update on backstage developments regarding the curse. Thanks to your continued support, your insatiable appetite for the truth, and indeed a seemingly everlasting passion for this 300-year-old mystery, it has somehow acquired a mini treasure all of its own. The many entrepreneurs and other business interests, attracted by the prospect of wealth and relics of considerable value, have moved in on the area. Due to this, the Nova Scotian government has kindly donated $1.5 million to the Curse of Oak Island show and the treasure quest thereof. One has to wonder, is this just an economic move? A rare governmental act of generosity? Or rather, a cunning investment? maybe due to being aware of compelling evidence suggesting that the island does indeed contain something of great value. Additionally, although the History Channel is infamous for hyping upcoming shows with startling and often exaggerated rumours, they have indeed suggested that something has been found over summer, a mysterious key and also chest of some form. Regardless of rumours, the investment not only confirms the fact that the brothers are indeed determined to get to the bottom of this mystery, and it is also an incredible incentive for the History Channel to continue running with the show. During our most recent research, it seems we have inadvertently stumbled across documented evidence of ancient habitation of the surrounding Nova Scotian area. Not only that, but due to their activities many thousands of years ago, a logical reason for the construction of man-made Smith's Cove. Featured in the BBC documentary series known as Wild Canada, imagine the shock when David Attenborough begins to describe this little gem in detail. Ancient people, coffer damming or constructing man-made pebble beaches at low tide all along most of the Nova Scotian coastlines, all with the purpose of creating artificial oyster bays. And amazingly, these artificial bays are actually of the exact same layout as Smith's Cove. Could this be an answer to one of the many remaining yet largest riddles on the island? Could this man-made coastline actually be an extremely old oyster farm? The old cofferdam found, being but a mere part of this ancient civilization's activity, now witnessed and documented all throughout Nova Scotia, Regardless of whether this solves the riddle of why Smith's Cove was once created, we still have no suitable explanation for highly advanced, masterfully constructed flood ducts coated in coconut fiber sprawling out from within the island's inner workings, strongly supporting the continued premise that something was indeed hidden in this island, something hidden using considerable effort. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more. Hello fellow treasure hunters, welcome back. It has been a while since we sunk our respective teeth into the quest for the truth. Our journey of discovery has revealed some startling connections to our mysterious island in the waters of Nova Scotia. What I now believe, and am convinced I am pursuing, is a miraculous artifact indeed, a golden chest that is said to contain two sacred stone tablets. Inscribed with ten particular commandments, it is of course the Ark of the Covenant, and it has to be one of the most extraordinary artifacts in history. It was said to be able to raise storms, radiate divine fire, level city walls, smash chariots and destroy entire armies. Moreover, according to legend, it could summon angels and even manifest the voice and presence of God. 
During my research, I have found, apart from the laws of physics, nothing to say this artifact doesn't exist. It was kept in Solomon's temple in Jerusalem until it disappeared from history in 597 BC. Biblical scholars, archaeologists and adventurers alike have spent years searching for the last resting place of the Ark. This final resting place, I have discovered, was created by the Knights Templar. If you have been watching my videos, you will know of the overwhelming Templar links to the island, and the treasure hunt thereof, in which we adorn with our fascination. The most intriguing question I found myself asking, was how could such an object possibly exist? I however was never on the hunt for mythical relics, I never fancied myself an Indiana, I would more than likely become one of the many skeletons littering the cave systems of Earth. But rather I hunt something that is the most real of all, the truth. However, when along this journey you encounter very intelligent and powerful figures, throughout history, claiming to have pursued this item, not only that but to have found it. You begin to wonder, you wonder what exactly it is that they found. This question for me came secondary to where they hid it, as this question I never asked, I came across this legend while pursuing an entirely different treasure, which turned out to be the very same. I have been diverted away from my pursuit on the Green Isles of England, in favor of unraveling events upon the island of Oak, alas, I again cast anchor into the murky and treacherous salty waters that once enveloped me. And since the brothers have provided us with some much needed excitement, quench the thirst for gold, I felt it worthy of my attention. Since the first auger drilling on the island during the middle of last century. A vault has indeed been the most likely candidate, and the most hunted target and depth at the money pit since its suspected discovery. These auger drillings have been surrounded by controversy, most notably the missing golden fragments brought up with the sample, that was apparently stolen along with a small piece of parchment, coated in liquid mercury, that still exists for study, it was part of a larger document, written in a fine ink, only one written letter is visible. When this drilling was done, it was reported that they broke through the roof of what they believe was a vault. Ever since this event, with the fragments brought up with traces of mercury, known to have been used to preserve parchment if submerged underwater, many have been convinced a treasure lay within this cavern, while others suspect it is just a natural cave system. Nevertheless this vault has been a huge target to confirm. Fast forward to present day, and we now have successful dives to this depth, with modern technologies we have done what many felt impossible. Not only that, but dive reports have confirmed a vault with smooth sides, this strongly discredits a natural formation. Add to this maybe the most compounding piece of evidence this century so far, multiple positive metal detections for gold at this depth. Since these are the only dives done so far on the vault, I do not have any further information on the vault to share with you. We know from excruciating research, digs and experiments on the island, a tremendous amount of effort went into the trap, firstly the flood channels, made from stone slabs, which do indeed extend into the sea covered in coconut fiber, the oak layers at every 10 feet, and the sheer amount of digging that was done by hand. Why would you create such an elaborate structure, just to bury the treasure below the flood tunnels? Another hypothesis occurs, that there is indeed a treasure of gold laying in the money pit, corroborating the stone tablet's message, yet this, if true, I believe is but a small offering compared to what the island really hides. In conversation the brothers believe they have tracked it, they believe they may have hit pay dirt in the form of national treasure, I'm yet to be convinced. But admittedly they are certainly making huge progress in revealing the money pit's secrets, a pit that has taken numerous lives, and countless fortunes. I will be continuing to cover discoveries on the island and linking them to the historically known research, my research into Jolie and Graham Russell's amazing discoveries in the UK pertaining to the Templar treasures will also be released shortly. As always, thanks for watching, stay tuned for more.
This extraordinary document reveals how the Vatican inquiry found no evidence of wrongdoing. It was the Pope himself, Clement V, who directly intervened and declared the Templars heretics. The report appears to show that the pontiff was after their wealth, said to include priceless treasures once housed in the Temple of Jerusalem, and consequently lost when the city was ransacked in ancient times. This document then reveals the stories I have conveyed thus far, regarding the discoveries the knights made at the Temple Mount are corroborated by the Pope of the Catholic Church. Which bodies within this sequence of historical events were found to be the heretics remains to be seen. But despite the arrest and torture of leading Templars, and the wholesale seizure of their lands, nothing of this fabled hoard was ever officially found. Most historians doubt the existence of the Templar treasure. My research has led me from beyond the shores of Oak Island, they revealed to me an intelligence within the Templar sect, an intelligence of nobility of the highest degree, they have developed an intricate web of possible pathways of discovery, that can unlock in a person the knowledge of what they truly hold dear in life, by revealing what they pursue, and what they are willing to give up for these things. We have come to the point where research becomes, maybe one of the most amazing real-life treasure hunt stories ever. The trail was picked up by Jolie and Graham Russell, compiled by Graham Phillips, published within his book, The Templars and the Ark of the Covenant. In the heart of England, close to Stratford-upon-Avon, famous as the birthplace of William Shakespeare, is the village of Temple Herdwig, named after the Templars who once resided there. After the Third Crusade in the late 12th century, these Templars returned from the Holy Land to build a chapel to house certain holy relics they claimed to have found. Many Crusaders came home with items purportedly associated with early Judaism and Christianity, and with characters and events in the Bible, but the Temple Herdwick Knights are said to have discovered the most famous biblical artifact of all, the Ark of the Covenant. At least, according to local legend. They certainly claimed to have found what appear to have been considered hallowed relics at the time. Contemporary records of land and property holdings reveal that in 1192 the chapel housed quote, objects sacres, translated as sacred objects, which the Templars had acquired in the Holy Land, including what was described as a large golden chest. This is exactly what the Ark of the Covenant was said to be. According to the Old Testament, it was a large golden box, made to contain the tablets inscribed with the Ten Commandments, lost when the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem in 587 BC. Although the Templars were rounded up in 1306, some evaded capture. 600 years later, a British historian suggested that they managed to survive in secret at Temple Herdwick until 1350, when they were wiped out by the Black Death. Jacob Cope Jones, who lived in the area, not only believed they possessed the lost Ark, he also claimed to have discovered its secret hiding place. Having fallen out with fellow scholars for ridiculing his work, Cope Jones refused to reveal his findings. He intended to carry out an excavation of his own, but sadly it never transpired. In 1906 he contracted tuberculosis and decided to take his secret to the grave. Well, almost. Knowing he had only a short time to live, the eccentric historian left behind a bizarre epitaph. He designed a stained glass window that he commissioned to be made and installed in a new church that was being built close to his home in the village of Langley. Astonishingly, on his deathbed he announced that the window contained a series of clues to lead to where he was sure the Ark was hidden. Most dismissed him as a crank, while others who attempted to crack the code gave up without success. Completed in 1906, the year Cope Jones has died, Langley Chapel is one of the smallest churches in England, and the window in question is set into a side wall. Called the Epiphany Window, it depicts the three wise men visiting the baby Jesus on Epiphany, the twelfth night of Christmas between January the 5th and 6th. Matthew's Gospel relates how three mystics from the East followed a miraculous star that led them to Bethlehem where Christ was born. According to Christian tradition, the wise men ultimately found Jesus when a rooster uncharacteristically crowed at midnight on top of the building where the child slept.
It was ultimately discovered that in the 1940s the entire area around the fountain was dug up to widen the lane and to build a number of houses along the new road. The records showed that the excavated rubble had been used to divert a stream in a nearby wood and this area too was investigated by the geophysics team. Although there was no evidence of any gold objects like the Ark of the Covenant, one thing was found that must have originally come from the ground excavated beside the water fountain. In the banks of the stream, a flat stone slab was discovered which was about an inch thick, a foot and a half long, and a foot wide. Made of sandstone, it was inscribed with what appeared to be 13 separate symbols, cut into the stone to a depth of about a quarter of an inch. The slab had clearly been broken off from a longer piece as the one end was irregular and jagged. The other end, however, was smoother and had been deliberately rounded at the corners. If the Templars' treasures had been hidden in Chapel Green they had long since been removed, either by Jacob Cove Jones or someone else. The stone slab, however, may have been overlooked. The slab was taken to the British Museum in London, which boasts England's best facilities for identifying ancient artifacts. However, as the stone was not made from organic matter it could not be carbon dated, and as it had been removed from its original location and used for landfill its age could not be determined by the usual archaeological methods. How long ago the slab was shaped and inscribed was also a mystery as the symbols carved into it could not be identified. They appeared to match no form of ancient or modern writing. In fact, they could not be matched with any known alphabet or symbol system on the museum's massive database. It is just possible that the tablet may have been the most important artifact of all. The sandstone from which it was cut was identified as a rennet sandstone, precisely the same sort of rock from which Jbelman bar is formed. In the Templars and the Ark of the Covenant, Graham Phillips Jody and Graham Russell go in search of the lost Ark and the treasures once housed in the Temple of Solomon. Further clues discovered in the Epiphany window lead to other remarkable discoveries and an incredible adventure that must be one of the most astonishing real-life stories ever told. As always, thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more.
Welcome back fellow YouTubers, if this is the first time you are joining us, I recommend looking back at the past videos first, this is segment 2 of the Masonic Connection. Thank you. Why all the Freemasons do you ask? The first thing that I found startling when researching this information, was how like the Masonic ritual were to the pits layout, the trap doors being the log barriers etc. The question is why all the Freemasons why all the interest from a society full of secrets, and one with lots of knowledge and information we the public have no access to, not for one of trying anyway. I did dig deeper as it happens. I found information that would incriminate you in court anyway, of knowing more than you are telling. I found this while looking around the Grand Lodge's websites. This text file is an excerpt from a booklet written by a brother, Lavener Johnson of Centennial King George Lodge in 1991. Many years before Oak Island became the focus of a treasure hunt, a group landed on the island with a cargo of treasure which they had to leave there. That cargo of treasure was considered so valuable that it justified doing a tremendous amount of work to give it the required security. The plan for concealment and recovery was simple and effective. Evidence indicates that the depositors never managed to return, and none of the many treasure hunters has discovered the secret of the concealment in spite of all their attempts, and although the necessary information has been available to them for many years, do you get a sense this guy knows more than he is letting on, he continues. In 1973 a hole was drilled down to 110 feet some 660 feet northerly from the money pit. The drill was said to have brought up a small piece of wire from that depth, and also to have struck what seemed to be a metal plate. A shaft was sunk to examine the significance of the drill findings, but at 100 feet down surface water was becoming a problem. With all the modern pumps and power available the shaft was abandoned within 10 feet of those drill findings. One has to ask what suddenly made its significant evidence become so insignificant. Some unrevealed evidence led to the sinking of Borehole 10X, about 150 feet east of the money pit. It went down to about 240 feet, far down into bedrock. Many tales have been told about the significance of 10X, but after a great deal of time and money was spent it seems that this unrevealed evidence was misinterpreted. These efforts certainly bring into question the value or significance of any artifact found in the depths of Oak Island. If enough people could have the opportunity of learning what the evidence really indicates at Oak Island, it should change the whole direction of the search for the solution to the mystery of the Oak Island treasure. That is the purpose behind the publication of this. In spite of all the devastation that has occurred at Oak Island, the general elevations are still apparent. The treasure is still in its original location, the high ground is where it was before, and there are still landmarks existing that could give a very close approximation of where the treasure lies. It will be unfortunate if the hunt continues on in future as it has in the past, until the mystery of the Oak Island treasure is totally discredited, and the meaning of the drilled stones in the triangle are lost for all time. There is nothing to indicate that the Oak Island treasure has been retrieved. It must still be there in the high ground, and its retrieval would be a wonderful event for Nova Scotia and Canada, both historically and archaeologically. What a statement! And the meaning of the drilled stones in the triangle are lost for all time. What could he mean by that, and secondly what do they know? My guess is in short he is saying we are digging in the wrong place. Could Randville be right about the Birch Island Triangle, is this the triangle he means? What does he know was found in the original beholds? The Freemasons clearly know something is there, and the symbology has continued. Behold 10x behold, 6x as well from the show, x is 6 in Masonic symbolism. And 10 is x in Roman. Roman sword anyone? I digress. Even if Rick and Marty are Freemasons it looks as though they are after the same things as us, treasure. Or the Holy Grail. Or the Arch of the Covenant. Whatever they think is there, it is profound. If the literature is correct and I have no reason to doubt the sources myself then Masons first officially arrived on the island in 1738, that would be right around the time, the supposed Onlyso company turned up, if the boys are just in reality three symbolic wise men and the depression from the burial of the treasure was still visible then it would make sense that they went back to get it. But why set off the trap then? Anyway no matter what happens in the next series of the curse I just hope they tell the world if they find it. To finish this part. All of the theories I have discovered along my way around the wonderful big wide web ranging from aliens to robots. I will continue to do my own type of digging. Please feel free to get involved. Enjoy, and thank you. Thank you.
What I am about to tell you is the true story of Oak Island. The story's series of events have been established from over three years of meticulous research, examination of evidence, land features, geological surveys, witness testimonies, historical records, historian research, cryptography, Masonic symbolism, ritual, and membership, excavated artifacts, and over one dozen test digs, even going so far as to acquire information hidden from the public. There is a story that surrounds the treasure of Oak Island, that is steeped in historical event and importance, however it is hidden from the public, some powerful people from the past felt this was for good reason. Every lead, every reliable trail of data, testimony, historical fact and Oak Island artifact regarding the treasure, and the search thereof, have led me to the same conclusion, every solid link of information regarding the numerous theories surrounding the island, point to and support this tale. First my method of investigation. I set out on this quest to find out two things above all others, is there actually a treasure, and if so who hid it there? I was not interested in listening to fantastic tales unless they were based on fact, a strong argument was the most important thing I was looking for when investigating theories surrounding the island. There are many legends ranging from Vikings to pirates even aliens. As I dug deeper into the information surrounding the quest, the ideas evidence and truth became flooded with conjecture, a metaphorical flooding of the truth, a flooding reminiscent of the island itself. Everyone seemed willing to put forward a claim, but most seemed to lack a solid theory as to why, when and how. So I began to collect all the solid data regarding test digs, landmarks, features and artifacts etc., to try to see what was actually there on the island. When trying to establish who could get to an island in Nova Scotia pre-1700, I had to ignore historical paradigm in favor of hard facts from the island. One of the most interesting discoveries are the Templar coins found on the island, during a metal detecting expedition. These coins were from England and dated from the 1600s. How intriguing indeed. When I began to delve into the logistical understanding of what evidence there is to be found on the island, regarding man-made manipulation of the landscape, and the work that would have had to have been put into making them, for example the man-made beach of Smith's Cove, the log-layered money pit of every 10 feet, with the stone tablet at 90. Oh and let's not forget the fact that there are indeed tunnels leading from the island off into the coastline, laid down with coconut fibers over the tops of them to prevent them becoming blocked. This work would have required a coffered dam constructed around the south coast of the island, a coffered dam whose remains have already been found coded in Roman. This dig and the design of the entire trap, took tremendous effort and planning to create. There was a group however that were able to take on such a tremendous task, or rather teach others how to do similar around 1700 and some time before, a very able group of stonemasons, who would later create a Masonic order. My initial discovery, one in which I have already discussed in my more recent videos, is the Masonic connection surrounding the treasure hunt, although concealed from the surface, more than 90% of the treasure hunters involved in the search post 1795, have been Freemasons, access to the search through the years has been deliberately restricted to anyone who was not a high degree Mason, and all companies surrounding the dig, from the Onslow company in the 1800s all the way up to present day with Triton and their famous Behold 10X, are owned funded and ran by the Masonic order. Some of these masons for numerous reasons, had leaked knowledge that was discovered and then concealed from the public regarding the hunt, for example an explanation of a professional attempt at cracking the codes of the island, and the information found in a dead 33rd degree masons papers linking tortured Templars to the island, many pieces of information have come to light in which I have already covered, the treasure has always been seen as something of vast importance to this secretive society. This is the real story of Oak Island. Robert the Bruce, the Normans, and the Sinclairs of Roslyn all from within the English, Scottish and Irish realms, including some of their French relatives were the first members and founders of the Knights Templar, around 1070 Scotland would gain one of the largest navies in Europe, and their ancestral homes within the glens of Scotland, became the Templar headquarters in Hiding, whether these places still are is unknown. In 1398 a century before Columbus, Henry Sinclair of Roslyn would lead an expedition to lands in eastern Canada and New England. These had also supposedly been visited by the Norse for centuries before. His navigator was Antonio Zeno who kept detailed maps and records of the voyage, landing in Nova Scotia on the second day of June 1398, on none other than Oak Island. Soon after Columbus's supposed official trip in 1441 the Sinclairs of Scotland ordered a fleet of stonemasons from across Europe, this was to carry out a mammoth and secret task of digging a huge vault into a rock side to hide a large treasure and to supposedly conceal an army depending on the source, complete with booby traps, to snare any eager looters, sound familiar? This group of masons were bestowed with a responsibility of trust, the Masonic Order was created off at the back of the vast fortunes of extremely important jewels, and artifacts, that the Knights of the Crusades gained from their rampages across the unknown worlds of the time. 
during their first decade of life, and because of the Sinclair's vast Templar fortune, this group of stonemasons were able to form their own secret sect, known as the Freemasons. When James II became king he decreed the Sinclair family to be the hereditary guardians of the Freemasons. But betrayal was in the air. Soon after the successful construction of this secret lair in the Highlands, religious conflict would sweep across Scotland, some suspect from a leaking of knowledge of the vast fortunes these Catholic Templars possessed, Protestant mobs inspired by Calvinism began targeting Catholic churches in Scotland, attempting to ransack them of their gold and other treasures. When the Sinclairs and other Templar clans became aware of the approaching invasions, their religious treasures were gathered up and rescued from Protestant hands. The Crown of England at this point was under Protestant control. England and was made to rise up against the families that controlled Scotland, mainly the Sinclairs. The battles would rage on for nearly a century. In 1542 the Battle of Solway saw the defeat of Oliver Sinclair and with him the Scottish families that controlled Scotland. At the same time 33rd degree Mason documentation would have Templars trapped at Glastonbury, surrounded by the King of England and the Prime Minister of England's men, these knights either had in their possession the Holy Grail, or knew of its location. This source of evidence is covered in the previous videos, they were eventually tortured in London and executed. As Scotland was being swarmed by the English and the King's private army attempted to seize the last remaining Templar treasures and knights of England in Glastonbury. The Templars and the Sinclair family were already prepared for the treachery of the Freemasons. Henry Sinclair's mission while in Nova Scotia nearly a full century before, was to find and build a suitable vault for the treasure, this would be in the event that anything catastrophic should happen at home, this layer was built and booby-trapped by Knights Templar to house their most precious artifacts, it appears the Masons they had enlisted to help build their safe house in Scotland had betrayed them, and sold out to the Crown of England, the coins found on the island in the Roman numerals used on the old coffer dam, support their presence there at this time also, the decoded stone map created with pre-1700s techniques, or any other modern evidence that has been discovered, not to mention, the overwhelming Masonic involvement since this day that I have not only proven but laid out most of their lesser kept secrets. This all would be enough to support their presence archaeologically, only travel next Templar would have used Roman numerals in writing, coded religiously significant stone features, Christianic crosses that litter the island, tropical coconut fibers, English Templar coins, etc. There is support of the Templar treasure on the island, in the form of a testimony, from the most powerful family of France at that time, when the Sinclairs and Templars were all but extinguished, this family have kept these secrets for centuries, and have only admitted to knowing these secrets of the island very rarely, given to them by the last Sinclairs, the details of the information this family was bestowed with is still largely unknown. This small book review I found, while investigating historical data for corroboration, aptly titled, Lost Treasure of the Knights Templar, written by a Stephen Sarah, was pretty astounding. And I quote. When the Order of Knights Templar was ruthlessly dissolved by King Philip the Fair of France in 1307, the Order possessed immense wealth and political power. Yet none of the treasure amassed by the Templars has ever been found. This lost treasure is rumored to have contained artifacts of spiritual significance that were retrieved by the Order during the Crusades, including the genealogies of David and Jesus, as well as documents that trace these bloodlines into the royal bloodlines of Merovingian France, documents that were perceived by those in power in medieval Europe as a threat to the established order of church and state. But what connects this treasure to the Oak Island money pit, so called because of both the priceless treasure it may hide and the extraordinary sums of money spent in futile attempts to excavate it that has baffled treasure hunters for over 200 years? Using newfound historical evidence that places a Scottish presence in the New World one entire century before Columbus, Stephen Sir represents a fascinating and convincing scenario that is the Sinclair clan of Scotland transporting the wealth of the Templars, entrusted to them as the Masonic heirs the order, to a remote island off the shores of present-day Nova Scotia. The mysterious money pit that is commonly believed to have been built before 1497 and has guarded its secret tenaciously despite two centuries of determined efforts to unearth it. All of these efforts, one even financed by American President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, have failed, thanks to an elaborate system of booby traps, false beaches, hidden trains, and other hazards of remarkable engineering ingenuity and technological complexity created by its builders. I have yet to read Sarah's apparently accurate book, although after reading the review, I suspect, through painstaking historical and forensic research we have come to similar conclusions. However we differ in the fact that I believe, the Freemasons sold out in favor of Morpa, the Masons somehow found the island some 200 years later, the Knights Templar were hunted and tortured to extinction, but clearly none of them gave up the secrets of the island, this shows the magnitude of the importance of what's hidden there.
The stone tablet that the Masons dug up when they first found the island, was a decoy, even though they didn't even decode it and set off the booby trap regardless. The stone tablet can be shown to be a decoy to even the most simple-minded. The stone tablet had a message inscribed on it instructing the finder of it to continue digging. However when you follow the tablet's instructions you come into quite a bit of difficulty, that being the flooding tunnels that were dug in just below the tablet's location. Flooding the tunnel leading to the treasure forever. Even if the entrance is actually the money pit. If there are multiple decoy tunnels in the pit also, and we can't even explore the bottom of the pit, what hope is there? I will now be focusing my efforts on researching the methods of the Templars, how they hid their treasures in the past, what they had accomplished in acquiring during their reign, countries visited, etc. As season 4 of the curse looms, all I will hope for is that they finally state the obvious about the tablet, look deeper into the evidential artifacts that have been found on the island, and most importantly the things that link a group of people to the island before 1700, like the coins, the stone map, the cofferdom's remains, the masonic connection, etc, etc, like I have been doing for over 3 years. And that they share it all with the world, regardless of historical paradigm, regardless of backlash. The Roman sword it would appear, has been a successful litmus paper test, regardless of its authenticity, it has shown the rigid nature of the general public's opinions, when confronted with the view of history, that doesn't match that which they were taught in school. It would seem to the majority of us, history is indeed a mystery. Stay tuned, and thanks for watching. We can all see on the curse of Oak Island, the hunt for the hidden chamber beneath the money pit. This ritualistic hunt for our chamber, can be dated back to the original hiders of the treasures, predating the Knights Templar, the most valuable prize of the Israelites, lay under a place known as the Temple Mount. It is the place the Knights Templars took as their names, why name yourself after the ruins of an old temple in Jerusalem? What could they have found that would be so important to them? Well not only are there rumors, but also strong evidences to suggest that these knights found a secret chamber beneath the Temple Mount, one they had searched for and knew the location of before they dug for it. Within it lay the Ark of the Covenant, and the Holy Grail. On the exterior of Charter's Cathedral, by the north door, there is a carving on a pillar, which gives us an indication of the object sought by the burrowing Templars, representing the Ark of the Covenant, but in a rather strange context. The Ark is depicted as being transported on a wheeled vehicle. Evidence suggests that the Ark of the Covenant had been secreted deep beneath the temple in Jerusalem centuries before the fall of the city to the Romans. It had been hidden there to protect it from yet another invading army who had laid the city to waste. Hugh de Payen, one of the original nine Templar knights, had been chosen to lead the expedition mounted to locate the Ark and bring it back to Europe. Persistent legends recount that the Ark was then hidden for a considerable time deep beneath the crypt of Charter's Cathedral. The same legends also claim that the Templars found many other sacred artifacts from the old Jewish temple in the course of their investigations and that a considerable quantity of documentation was also located during the dig. A reasonable consensus is emerging that they contain scriptural scrolls, treatises on sacred geometry, and details of certain sacred knowledge of art science and the hidden wisdom of the ancient initiates of the Judaic tradition. The Copper Scroll, which was unrolled and deciphered at Manchester University under the guidance of John Allegro, was a list of all the burial sites used to hide the various items both sacred and profane described as the treasure of the Temple of Jerusalem. Many of these sites have been re-excavated since the discovery of the Copper Scroll, and several of them have disclosed not temple treasure but evidence of Templar excavation made in the 12th century. After their excavations were completed at the Temple Mount, the Knights returned to their native lands. Two of them ventured to Rosslyn, Scotland, where they set up the Templar headquarters. They had clearly recovered something which brought them great influences and wealth. Shortly afterwards, the Knights were given the official seal of the Roman Catholic Church, and their numbers swelled as wealthy landowners and aristocrats joined their ranks. The Templars went on a binge of temple construction and brought back many sciences, such as astronomy. Their order grew in stature, wealth and power quickly, and they won battle after battle against the Muslims during the various Crusades. The Templars apparently became a threat to the Church itself. The Pope and the King of France, Philip le Bel 
plotted to undermine the order and seize their considerable treasures in France. On Friday October 13, 1307, the king's men moved against the knights and arrested many of them. This is also why Friday the 13th is now considered unlucky. Although the papal conspiracy with King Philip succeeded in obtaining various confessions under torture and a considerable sum of Templar wealth, the conspirators never found the ultimate Templar treasure itself, which by now had been secreted away to Scotland. Even so, most of the order was wiped out in the raids, the leader, Jacques de Molay, was burned at the stake, and its members scattered across Europe. On March 22, 1312, the church officially dissolved the order by papal bull. This date also subsequently became significant, in not only the Nazi movement in Germany but also was another recurring NASA ritual date. Whatever ancient relics and treasures the Templars held from their Jerusalem and other Holy Land excavations, they were from this moment on secreted away beneath Roslyn Chapel in Scotland, in much the same way these same artifacts were once buried under the Temple Mount itself. The chapel itself bears no resemblance to a Christian structure, as many experts who have surveyed it have verified. Remarkably, it is laid out along the same architectural lines as the biblical dimensions given for the original Solomon's Temple. However, the Templars namely Henry Sinclair would travel to Nova Scotia, where he would create the New Scotland, or Grail Castle, it is claimed Canada became a settlement through this voyage, this trip was to create a hiding place for treasure, if ever needed due to mutiny. Henry claimed he had built a special Grail Castle on the island of Oak, called the Cross, this was the final clue needed in unlocking the treasure map. I find it astonishing that I may have actually tracked the treasure down, by solving the Templar clues, I feel I have successfully followed the Rosaline, to Rosaline. It seems others found out about the ruse before me. The mutiny by the Crown of England, was a double cross, believing the treasures were hidden in Nova Scotia, all the while, they never left Scottish soil, I now believe the money pit to have never been used to hide treasure, but was built for the purpose. Oak Island was never actually called, Oak Island, it is actually called the Island of Oak, this was a cunning shout out to the builders of the pit and its traps, the oak layers were also for this purpose, they were not to stop the pit from collapsing as how would you get out? Around the 16th to 17th centuries, and even before then, only one place on earth could be attributed to that name, the Island of Oak, and that would have been England. Some would say that England was built on oak. The Christmas Yule log was originally an oak log decorated with mistletoe and holly. They carried acorns for good luck, and to ward off illness. In the 1700s oak trees were in high demand by shipbuilders, and were grown especially for the purpose. In fact every ship commissioned by Drake and Nelson used up the wood from around 2,500 trees. Templars were smart enough to build a triangulation tower on the coast of Scotland, this tower lines up directly with Rosalind Chapel, this alignment was first noticed by YouTube user CFAP7865, the Oak Island cross discovered by Fred Nolan was key to confirming the link between Rosalind and the island of Oak, the maritime mapping technique used to create the cross pinpoints the tower, the maritime technique used was a clue to overseas voyage. The Golden Scroll shows evidence of them linking treasures together with coded mapping techniques, which I suspect would have been the cross's purpose. Henry Sinclair's mention of the cross, and also the building of a Grail castle, is very strong evidence to suggest they had indeed created a secondary hiding place for the relics. The most important clues discovered are the Masonic Confession, Nolan's Cross on the island, and the old maritime map with the mapping technique that links to the cross. The maritime cross mapping technique was crucial in solving the puzzle. The stone cross, lines up with the Templar Tower exactly, this tower leads you to Rosslyn. All roads have led to Rosslyn, when the church officially dissolved the Order of the Knights Templar by Papal Bull on March 22, 1312, surviving German members formed the Teutonic Knights, and the Scottish members went underground, only to eventually re-emerge as the Freemasons. This fragment of information the transformation of the knights to the missons, was the key in unlocking their ultimate deceit, the money pit. If you haven't already please go back and watch my previous videos, the connection of the masons to the treasure hunt that I have already uncovered, really has pulled the curtain back on their game, the Oak Island treasure hunt has become the most expensive treasure hunt of all time, but you may come to ask where did all that money go? It went to the Masonic companies built up around the island since the Holler's discovery, or I believe its construction. Freemasons love to leave clues, they also love to fool you out of money. All of this time the island has pointed at the location of the treasure, and all this time Freemasons have profited from fruitless endeavors to unravel their traps, 
Denver Airport and the Georgia Guidestones to name but a few, are prime examples of these guys laying out clues to their deeds. Once all of these things began to slot into place, the geology of the island, the Templars' history, the Masons' deceit, the decoys, the confessions, and the historical data. I began to worry that my efforts, for the past few years, along with others, had indeed been led down a giant flooded, Nova Scotian rabbit hole. In the 16th century, the Sinclairs of Roslyn were close advisors to the Scottish kings, and thus to Marie de Guise, the French regent. In 1546, Marie de Guise wrote one of her letters to William Sinclair. The letter included this remarkable passage, likewise that we shall be loyal and a true mistress to him, his counsel and the secret shown to us, which we shall keep secret. In 1556, she sent William Sinclair to France, to find more support for her daughter, Mary, Queen of Scots. It underlines the close relationship Marie de Guise and the Sinclairs had in the defense of the Scottish monarchy, a cause which was always close to the heart of the Sinclairs. The question is what the secret was, rather than Sinclair pledging his loyalty to the Queen Regent, it is the Queen Regent saying she will obey the Sinclairs and not betray him. Of interest is Barul's reference to a Scottish Templar and Masonic connection. Barul wrote in 1797, that the Templars had discovered three stones in Temple of Solomon, one of which carried the name of God. He argued that the three stones were secretly moved to Scotland after the Templars' dissolution in 1312. The Knights of the Temple made them the foundation for their lodge. Their successors, heirs of the secret, are currently the perfect masters of Freemasonry, the High Priests of Jehovah. Abbe Augustin Barul, February 10, 1741, May 10, 1820, was a Jesuit priest mostly known for creating and revealing the Knights Templars, the Bavarian Illuminati and the Jacobinians in his book Memoirs illustrating the history of Jacobinism. The three stones were a slab carrying the name of God, a cover stone which gave access to a hidden room and which displayed a four-headed cherub. The third stone was a square, white stone on which the Ark of the Covenant had originally been placed. It opened the way for books such as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Several Sinclairs have been buried inside the Abbey at Rosalind. At least seven of the stones in the floor of Holyrood Abbey are memorials to Sinclairs, although most of them date from the 18th and 19th century. The Sinclairs were the keepers of the Order of the Knights Templar, and all of the secrets surrounding Oak Island I have uncovered and so far, also Rosalind. The Knights Templar first came to Scotland in 1128 during the reign of King David I, whom Hughes de Payens visited as part of his international recruitment drive. De Payens made a very favorable impression on King David, to the extent that he later surrounded himself by Templars and appointed them as the guardians of his morals by day and night. As a result of this royal favor, through gifts from both the king and his court, the Templars acquired a substantial property holding in Scotland. When the Templars were rounded up in France in 1307, Scotland itself I have discovered, was actually not affected. I now suspect the money pit to be nothing more than a trap for anyone seeking to profit from the Templars' wealth. It is also still a source of profit for those in the know, I am also willing to state that while the Crown was hunting the Templars to extinction, not only did they survive, but they still possess their treasures, as the Masons appeared to infiltrate the Order for the Crown, the opposite occurred, the true treasures never left Scotland, and the Crown of England ended up in the hands of Freemasonry. All those involved with the digging of the Oak Island trick, may have believed they were indeed hiding the Grail and the Ark, they may have believed this is what they were digging, but after it was not needed, the Masons decided to test out their own skills on the world, and make a hefty profit while doing so. In the next segment we will be pressing on for the whereabouts of the Oak Island treasure. Looking at all other clues surrounding the curse. And delving into the relics left behind by the Templars during the new chapter of our quest. As always, 